great to be able to open up God's Word with you today. Uh, Pastor Dave is in uh, West Helena, Arkansas. He is, he wouldn't want me to tell you this, but I'm going to tell you this. He can get mad at me later. Pastor uh, Dave is the uh, president of the Pastors Conference of the Arkansas State Baptist Convention, and in that role, he has had the opportunity to um, have a great relationship with the vice president, Jarvis Smith, who's the pastor at Second Baptist Church, West Helena. And so he and some of our team members are there this morning leading in worship, developing that partnership together. Um, and it is a wonderful experience for uh, Pastor Dave to be there and for them to be under his teaching. So this morning together, we have the opportunity to look at God's Word. If you have a copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Acts chapter 12 this morning. And as you're turning there, I don't know if some of you were like me, but I was uh, pretty frightened last, this last Wednesday at uh, the storm that had blown through. I wasn't necessarily alarmed by the thunder or all the lightning. Rather, I was alarmed by the incredibly loud crash outside my bedroom window. Upon further inspection, this is what I found. In the words of my son, Dad, that's a big tree. And no matter what I wanted, the moment that tree started falling, I couldn't in any way be able to stop it. It's a 150-foot tall post oak tree that had a mind of its own. It is an unstoppable object once in motion. And as we continue to look at the book of Acts, we're going to learn that the gospel is a movement. In fact, it's more than a movement. This morning, I pray that we understand the gospel is an unstoppable gospel. Jesus was the Word, and the Word became flesh, and the Word dwelt among us and lived a perfect life. And in that perfection, he was able to die on a cross to save us from our sin. His sacrifice on the cross later died, later rose again three days later. Scripture says we place our faith in him and believe in him that he did raise from the dead, that we will have salvation and eternal life. And this was the message that the early disciples began to preach. And men and women and boys and girls and villages and regions began to believe. And the gospel took hold. The gospel is not just a word that we talk about and describing the events of Jesus. It is a movement, and the scripture is very clear. It is an unstoppable gospel. And so as the book of Acts unfolds, as we've been studying this book for quite some time, we were reminded that just last week, two weeks ago, that the gospel's on the move. That the gospel begins and originates with Jesus. He tells his disciples, I want you to go to the very ends of the earth. In fact, I want you to start here in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and then I want you to go. And the gospel should be on the move. And as we've been in the first part of the book of Acts, we understand the gospel is growing. People are coming to faith. Peter and others are preaching. And hundreds, if not thousands, are coming to Christ. And with that come some opposition, but the church is growing. The church is growing. And then last week, or two weeks ago, we realized that the gospel doesn't just stop in Jerusalem, but it will continue to go forth. And so the Jerusalem church sent one of their own, Barnabas, over to Antioch to help start and plant that church there. And it's in Antioch that they first were called Christians. The gospel is growing. The church is growing. The gospel is of movement. It's an unstoppable gospel. And that brings us to Acts chapter 12 where we begin to see a very familiar story of Peter's escape from prison. Now, the gospel, the, the scripture certainly has some drama, certainly has some highs and some lows as you read through the narratives, but here in Acts chapter 12, there's some comedy. It's a rather fun account of what's taking place, and, and sometimes we miss it, but we know the story of Peter escaping prison. There he's locked up. Scripture says he's chained to two guards, one guard in one arm, one guard in the other, and there's another set of guards outside his prison cell. And there, Scripture says, he sleeps. And the angel came into his cell. Light was shone brightly, but it didn't wake old Peter. I don't know about you, but I'm a dad who loves to wake up my children. And some of you are a little abrupt in how you wake up your kids. I'm a gentle riser. 
So I go to my children's rooms, and I mean, every day. This is not a one, this is every day. I'll walk in the room, and I'll, hey, buddy, good, egg, good morning, you know, wakey, wakey, <laughs> eggs and bakey. And if they don't rouse, I'll go, and I'll kind of stroke their hair, and I'm like, hey, it's time to get up. And with my daughter, you know, I'm real gentle with her, with my boys. I'm like, all right, seriously, it's, you got to get up. You got to go to school, right? Well, the angel of the Lord does not wakey-wakey old Peter. <laughs> Scripture says that the angel of the Lord struck him. And that word struck is to create a, or to inflict a heavy blow. The angel of the Lord gets in the cell. The lights are shining. The lights are on. Peter's not waking up. I don't know if it was a swift kick, if it was an elbow to the ribs, but Peter finally came to his senses. But the scripture says throughout this account that Peter thinks all of this is a dream. And so the angel is maybe a little frustrated with Peter. The angel has to tell him every single thing to do. He tells him to get up. He tells him to get dressed. It tells him, get your shoes. Get your it sounds like me with my seven-year-old. Let's go. And finally, Peter follows the angel out, and they are led out through one guard, led out through another. And we finally get to a gate there, the last gate before Peter tastes freedom. And the scripture says that the gate opened on its own accord. And Peter is now on the street free. He's escaped from prison. He is on the lamb running from King Herod. And he goes to Mary's house, Mary knocks on the door. We know the story. Rhoda, who's a servant girl, comes to the door. And what she doesn't expect is Peter. Because the disciples are in the upper room praying for Peter. And yet there is Peter at the door. And in her excitement, she forgets to open the door. And she runs over to the disciples and tells them it's Peter. Now the whole time I just have imagining that Peter's just knocking on the door like, um, I'm, someone please open the door. They're coming for me. They're going to know that I've escaped. Someone please open the door. And the disciples don't believe her. And eventually they, they go down. They grab Peter. Peter's up with them and tells them all that the angel of the Lord did for him. And then he says, go and tell James, the leader of the Jerusalem church. And then scripture says Peter left. And that's the account that we're pretty familiar with when we read about Acts chapter 12. And I, I think there's some truths that we're going to unpack today in that narrative story. But today, I think, I want us to look at the bookends of that story. What happens before Peter actually gets imprisoned and what happens after he escapes? Because there's a common character in the bookends of this story in King Herod. And I think King Herod is often overlooked because of the escape of Peter. The Peter narrative is a great story. There's great truth to it. But I think there might be some very important details that we miss in the life of Herod that help remind us that the gospel is an unstoppable gospel. If the book of Acts is all about the gospel going out, I think when we need to look at the life of Herod so that we can be reminded that no matter what, no matter who may get in the way, the gospel is an unstoppable gospel. So let's look at Acts chapter 12, starting with verse 1. Let's read a few verses together. Acts chapter 12, verse 1. And about that time, Herod, the king, laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Herod, the king, laid violent hands on the Christians. Now this is Herod Agrippa. We know and are familiar with the name Herod. As you've read through the Gospels, even in the book of Acts, you are seeing the word Herod in this person. But in fact, there are actually three Herods that we may be familiar with. The first Herod is Herod Agrippa's grandfather, Herod the Great. We know that his impact on the gospel was found when he heard through wise men that there was going to be a baby born in Bethlehem, that he would be called the king of the Jews. And so Herod the Great didn't like that one bit. He thought he should be the only king. And so he sent word that all the males under the age of two in the Bethlehem should be killed. 
Now fast forward, we know of Herod's grandson, Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was the Herod that beheaded John the Baptist. Herod Agrippa is Herod Antipas' nephew. And Herod Agrippa continues his family hatred of the gospel, his hatred of Jesus as Messiah and end of Christianity. In fact, what we know of this Herod here in Acts chapter 12 of Herod Agrippa is that he is famously known, according to historians, to be a political chameleon. He's one of these politicians that says what he needs to say in front of every kind of crowd to win their favor. So historians might have said that in front of Romans, he would have done what the Romans wanted. In front of the Jews, he would have sought how to seek out their favor. Herod Agrippa was a people pleaser. In fact, the scripture reminds us that that he just wasn't a people pleaser. He desired to get as much power from as many people as possible. And so Agrippa continues his onslaught of the church just like his grandfather and his uncle. And much like, unlike those who went from uh, oppressor to oppressor or Christian to Christian, Agrippa decides he's going to attack the church from within. If I can take out the leaders, uh, I can destroy the church. And so Agrippa goes and he kills the first martyr in James. James is the son of Zebedee, the brother of John. And what's interesting here is that Luke kind of walks quickly through the martyrdom of good old James. I'm not sure why. We don't necessarily know why. But obviously the focus in this passage isn't so much on James being a martyr, but on what Herod is doing to try to stop the gospel. And so James is martyred. And when Agrippa saw that it pleased the Jews, he thought, oh, I'm on to something here. Who else do I need to go after? James, although a disciple was not necessarily one of the bigger disciples. Peter certainly had more influence in many other directions, especially as we read through the book of Acts. As Peter would preach, thousands would come to faith. And so he went after Peter and had him arrested. And we understand that the arrest of Peter was more than just to try to scare him. He had every intent to do to Peter what he had done to James. Unfortunately, it was Passover. It would have displeased the Jews to put Peter on trial and to kill Peter in the midst of the Passover. And so they have to wait. And so Peter's in prison. Agrippa is a people pleaser. Disregard for moral truth, disregard for what is right or wrong, didn't live by a moral code, but lived by a social code. A social code. Valued popularity over piety, was desired to be more liked than it was to be right. And what's interesting is we step back from this story, we think about Herod and and kind of his political uh, foundation and what he was setting himself out to do. I think we see a lot of Herods in our own cultural landscape. Men and women who value being politically correct in front of any crowd rather than being biblically right. People pleasers that fear taking a stand Fear that if they take a stand on a moral issue, it may hurt someone's feeling. And so we have people in our culture, just like Herod, who throw out their moral compass for the sake of inclusivity. Herod didn't want to offend anyone necessarily and try to make everyone happy. We know that Herod wasn't a Democrat or a Republican. We know he wasn't on the right or on the left. He wasn't postmodern or traditional. He aligned himself with everyone and as a result stood for no one. Now, if you think about our culture today, I think we could easily in our minds go, I think I know some Herods. People who don't really stand for much for fear it might hurt others. And the scripture is really clear that there are things we need to stand for. There is a right And there is a wrong. And when it comes to social issues, often we live in a culture that says we're afraid to take a stand for it might offend somebody. Can I just tell you, we say this often here at Geyer Springs, the gospel is offensive. There is a right and there is a wrong. And we as a culture of Christianity, as a culture of believers, need to take stands on issues of family on issues of gender, on issues of life. We are called by God to believe in his word and not just to believe in his word, but to believe it in such a way that we share the biblical truth. 
You know, we please God when we do what the Bible says. We please God when we vote what the Bible says. We please God when we support the things Jesus supported. And I want us to be clear. The Bible has rights and wrongs, do's and don'ts. And our Savior did a wonderful job of being able to right those who were in the midst of wrongs through clear teaching and through grace and love and mercy. We should take a note out of the the playbook of Christ as he's interacting with those who are wrong, helping them to understand the right. What Jesus doesn't do is say, whatever you want to do is fine. Jesus doesn't do that. He's not out like Herod is to try to get those to come on his side or win favor with them. Jesus has a mission and is to live his life according to the will of the Father that those who believe in him would have eternal life. The gospel is an unstoppable gospel because the gospel isn't out seeking favor. The gospel is doing exactly what the will of the Father is and setting the church out on mission to help others know who the gospel is and what the gospel's about. So King Herod wants to please the Jews. He arrests Peter. The blood of James is still fresh in the air, and the Jews are expecting the very same thing to happen to Peter as happened to James. The Jews didn't want Jesus to have any more power among them. They didn't, they didn't believe that he was a long way to Messiah. They didn't consider New Testament theology as right. Rather, it was a challenge to their Old Testament law. The Jewish leaders desired to help destroy the church, and Agrippa was there to aid them. First the death of Peter, now the death, first the death of James, now the death of Peter. And what's interesting here is that God intervenes. God miraculously does something in the life of Peter to bring him freedom. God is the hero of our narrative story, rescuing Peter from certain death. And Peter, when he finally realizes what's going on with the angel leading him out to prison, understands this truth. And not only does he understand it in his own life, but then he shares it with the disciples and he tells the disciples, now share this truth with James, the leader of the Jerusalem church, who's the half-brother of Jesus. You see, unlike Herod, Peter doesn't want any glory. Peter wants everybody to know that God is the one who intervened, that saved Peter from certain death. Look at the scripture, Acts chapter 12. We're going to skip on down to verse 11. In the middle of this story, Scripture says in verse 11, when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hands of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Do you know that our God does the unexpected? This is why the gospel is an unstoppable gospel. Herod is out killing the leaders of the church, yet the gospel is not stopping. It's not thwarted in any way. It continues to move forward despite Herod, the king of Judah. God's doing some incredible things here. And we're able to see this story kind of unfold. We see the pride of Herod. We see the power of Herod. We see him attempting to get in the way of the unstoppable gospel. And then we see Peter's escape, God intervening. Now, what about the last bookend of Herod? Let's look, skip over to verse 20 of Acts chapter 12 as we kind of look at this last narrative, and then we're going to apply this text for us today and what this means for us here in 2019. The Scripture says in verse 20, Now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and he came to him with one accord, and having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, and they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat behind the throne, delivered an oration to them, and the people were shouting the voice of a God and not of a man. Verse 23, immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give God the glory. And he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. Verse 24, but the word of God increased and multiplied. This is the last of Herod. What's taking place is that these two cities, Tyre and Sidon, are in some sort of economic war with with Herod. And they come to an agreement because they realize that Herod controls the food supply. 
And so they brought to him some sort of treaty. And, and Herod wants to accept this treaty on a very appointed day, the scripture says. This day was probably the day of a festival set aside to really praise Caesar. And so Herod takes this special day, puts on his royal robes, and there sits behind this throne, and he receives this treaty and gives this great speech, and the people say, this is not a man, this is a God. And what Herod did next brought his downfall. Herod accepted the title. And in accepting that title of a God, he offended God. And God struck him down. This man, all this ornation and these royal robes is now nothing but worm food lying in the dirt. And the result of all of this, the result of what Herod tried to do and stop the gospel, the result of what Herod tried to do in killing Peter, the result of what Herod tried to do in taking the glory and putting on himself, the result of all of that is that the word of God increased and multiplied. The gospel is a movement. It's an unstoppable gospel. So how do we apply this? A couple of things today. And if you're taking some notes, I encourage you to write some of these things down. Let's apply this chapter to us today because I think there's some truths here, not only in what we see in the bookends of Herod, but certainly in the escape of Peter that are meaningful to us. What do we take away? Number one, there is always God's presence is in the midst of the operation. God's presence is in the midst of of the operation. Whatever God is doing, he's in the middle of that. We always can know and always trust that God is always working. God is always at work. God didn't step back from his creation and say, good luck. Rather, God is always at work. One of the biggest questions I think we can walk away in Acts chapter 12 is, is really at the beginning of the first few verses. I don't know if you were like me earlier this, this couple of weeks ago. I, I began to think about this passage, and I wondered this. Why did God save Peter and yet let James be killed? Why did God take James's life and allow Peter to live? I don't know the answer to that question. And I don't know that the Scripture necessarily tells us that either. And it's a tough question when we begin a question about God asking why. For our God is, is greater than us. His thoughts are higher than ours. His ways are better than our ways. We don't know why necessarily God does certain things, but we do know this, that his presence is there. Regarding, regarding whatever's going on in the good or in the bad, God's presence is there. Some of you in the room have received the best news of your life this month. Some of you in the room have received the worst news in your life this month. Some of you are being healed from cancer. Some of you are being destroyed by cancer. Why? I don't know. But I know that God is in the best moments and in the worst. I know, God, that is in the peaceful times and in the chaotic ones. God's presence is around regardless of what may be going on. And I, I love the truth that the psalmist gives us in Psalm 34 and it reminds us that in the good times, God is present. Scripture says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and I shall continually praise his name in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. I sought the Lord, the scripture says, and he heard my cry. Do you know when you pray, God answers, God hears, God listens. God's there, God's present. He's not far away. He's not in some distant way. The scripture says he's around, he's present, he's available to us. And so even in this very difficult situation, where Peter goes and knocks on the door of Mary. And they're grieving the loss of their brother and their son. They may have asked, why is Peter alive and James wasn't allowed to be alive? But they can trust that the presence of the Lord is there. Psalm 23, in the midst of difficult times, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
There is presence in the midst of the operation. The second application, there should be prayer in the midst of opposition. There should be prayer in the midst of opposition. When James is killed, Peter's arrested. The church at Jerusalem does something very specific that Luke records. The scripture says they prayed earnestly. Now that word earnest means to be stretched out. Luke uses this word in Acts chapter 1. And it's most likely meant to, to have this idea of continuous, prevailing, always praying kind of concept. That they didn't worry, they weren't full of fear. They began to pray and they kept praying. Luke uses this word in Luke chapter 22 describing Jesus when he's praying at the Garden of Gethsemane. This idea of heartfelt, emotional, wholehearted, urgent pleading to God. Stretching out their mind and their heart towards him in continual prayer. And when Peter finds himself at the disciples' house knocking to get in, what are they doing? The disciples are praying. The church was a praying church. And through their prayers, God honored their prayers, and Peter was able to go face to face with them and tell them the story of what God had done. The church was asking, pleading, talking, seeking intimacy with the Father, coming together in prayer. Sometimes we look at prayer as the passive result of something we should be doing, when really it's the active participation of prayer that brings us together, that causes our faith to increase, and in the midst of incredible calamity and trial, my leader is in prison, my other leader has been killed, I can trust the Lord. There is prayer in this scripture in the midst of opposition, which begs the question, what do you do when opposition comes? When plans don't go your way, when you're full of fear, when the bills come, when the boss has a harsh word, when the doctor has that tone in his voice, or when that boy or girl doesn't give you the time of day, what do you do? I tell you what we shouldn't do. Probably not a good idea to go to Facebook and complain. I'm not sure that that mirrors or reflects that God is in control. God's called us in this moment, I think, in Acts 12, for us to be a praying church in the midst of opposition. What do you need to pray about today? What are you worried about? What are you frustrated about? What are you concerned about? What are you praying about? Prayer in the midst of opposition. Number three, there should be peace. There can be peace in the midst of oppression. Peace in the midst of oppression. One of the funnier parts of this entire story is the fact that Peter's too sleepy to wake up. Peter's asleep. Peter doesn't recognize the light of the angel. Peter is sound asleep. It reminds us of Jesus in Mark chapter 4 as the disciples are experiencing this great storm. Jesus is in the boat, but he's in the hull of the boat, and he's fast asleep. And the disciples are worried that they're going to die. The disciples can't believe that Jesus is asleep. I think it's funny because when we think about the life of Christ, Jesus, I don't know if he was playing a joke. I don't know if he was trying to teach them. I don't know exactly what he was doing, but I know this, that in a word he said, peace be still, and the calm came across the water. Could it be that Jesus was asleep because he was always in control? Could it be that Peter's asleep because he knows that God's on his throne? Could it be that, that he celebrates what Paul later on said, that to live is to die and to die is gain? Could it be that he understood that I compare all things, including my life, rubbish, comparing to knowing Jesus Christ my Lord? Could it be that Peter was so intimate with the Father that it didn't matter what was happening his way, he had peace? What a great encouragement for us. To be so intimate with our relationship with Jesus is not just that we know about Jesus, but we're walking with Jesus. Not just that we believe in Jesus or we sing about Jesus, but we're being led by Jesus. Not that we understand the Spirit, but we're in step with the Spirit. That's the kind of relationship that I want with my Savior so that when the opposition comes, I'm not worried, I'm not afraid, I'm not in angst, 
but I can sleep well. That's the peace that's afforded to us in that relationship with Christ Jesus. And there may be some in this room who don't have peace because you don't know who Christ is in your life. It could be that you've never accepted him as Savior. It could be that you're not walking with him. Either way, you're not sleeping well. I want to challenge you to be in such a relationship with God that you can have that peace. That when opposition comes, you take a breath. You sit back a second. You don't sweat the small stuff. You know that God is on his throne and you sleep well. We can continue to apply this story. Not only peace in the midst of opposition, but there's provision for every occasion. I remember several years ago, maybe six or seven years ago, I, I read this passage of scripture and, and, and I remember reading it again a few days ago, thinking about that very portion. If you look at Acts chapter 12, verse 10, the scripture says that the gate opened for them on its own accord. It was almost as if the gate in some way had a will, that it had life in it, that it opened on its own desire, its own ability. Peter is just about to taste freedom, sweet freedom, and the only thing in his way is this gate, but it opens. And there he walks in the street and goes and finds his friends, his comfort, and is able to continue forth with the gospel because the gospel cannot be held back by some little gate. What is your locked gate? What are your iron bars in your life that may keep you from experiencing true freedom in Christ? What prevents you from trusting God? Was it some event, some circumstance, some experience that caused bitterness in your life to keep you from trusting God? Maybe it's not that deep for you. Maybe it's just you are just sad, depressed. You've lost the joy of your salvation. What's keeping you from trusting the Lord? What's keeping you worse in your state of unbelief? You know, unbelief often causes me to forget about God's faithfulness. My unbelief manifests itself through worry, through the idea that I'm not good enough, that God isn't going to do what he said he's going to do, that, oh, no, I've made a mistake. Unbelief really stabs at our ability to be intimate with God and trust him. I, I think another form of unbelief in a lot of ways is this idea of comparison. There are a lot of young moms and young dads who compare parenting styles with other parents. Or, or maybe you compare yourself with another employee at your work. Or maybe you're a student and you compare yourself with other people on social media. And there's this idea that you're not good enough, that, that you're not gonna be able to take care of the things you wanna take care of well because someone else always has it better than you do. And I believe when we sit back and we think about that concept, I think it's a, it's a lot about unbelief in that moment. Now I want to get to a place like Paul mentions in Romans chapter 4, verse 20, talking about Abraham and Abraham's faith. He says this about Abraham. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promises of God, but he grew strong in his faith. And I pray that's what we do today. As a result of Acts chapter 12, as a result of seeing what God is doing and how he is keeping the gospel moving forward, it's an unstoppable gospel that our faith continues to increase and that as we continue to increase and believe in the promises of God, that we would give God all the glory that is due to his name because he has provided for every occasion. And I don't know what gate or what lock or what obstacle is in your way, but God does. And he is provider. And he has the ability to do that. So let him open your gates. Well, let's land the plane. Last point today, last idea of application is probably maybe the most obvious one. That a provision is for every occasion, pride leads to objection. Pride leads to objection. Herod's downfall was his pride, and God objected to Herod's pride. 
in an attempt to be God, God stepped in and stopped Herod. A few weeks ago, I was speaking to our students at Camp Collide, and it wasn't something that I had planned to say, but certainly the Holy Spirit was in that moment, and we're teaching, and, and I'm getting the opportunity to uh, just invest in some of our students, our, our 10th and 11th graders, and, and I quite don't really know what I was speaking on, but I know this moment of what God told me to say, and it was such a, an inspiration for me personally, and I think it's really pointed for us as we think about Herod. We are not the center of our own story. That your circumstances, your life, your things, your job, your kids, your career, your ambitions are not yours. You are not the center of your own story. That God desires to be the center of your own story. That God is the one who gave you those children, who gives you that job, who provided those material things. That God is the one who gave you those circumstances. You are not the center of your own story. And we, the church, think that we're the center of our own story. We get in big trouble. You see, churches are notorious for being prideful as a body. Look what we were able to accomplish. Look of all the things we were able to do. Look at how big our budget is or how much things we have or how we were able to go from nation to nation or globe to globe and be able to do great things. We are not the center of our own story. We exist not for us, not for Geyer Springs, not for our blended service or our modern service. We exist for him and him alone. Church, this morning, can we be very thoughtful that maybe one of the things that gets in the way of the gospel movement is not necessarily those outside the church, but those inside the church? Maybe this morning you're taking thought and stock about where you are, and sometimes we think, oh, I'm Peter. I'm full of faith. I've got all the peace in the world, and I'm just waiting for God to do whatever he's going to do, and I'm happily going to follow him. And I'll be honest with you. I think this week, I found myself looking a little bit more like Herod than like Peter. A little bit more prideful than I really want to admit. A little more anxious or doubtful than I really care to admit. And so maybe this morning, you'd be thoughtful about where you are. The gospel is an unstoppable gospel. There's nothing can get in the way of what God's plan is. And I don't want to attempt to get in the way of what God may be doing in his glory for the gospel, and the movement of, of how he's orchestrated our body to be investing in the gospel. But I certainly want to be one, a man, a husband, a father, who's fueling the gospel movement. It's not in the way, but I'm participating in it and I'm helping it in every way possible. Church, let's be a church of prayer. Church, let's be a church of belief. Church, let's be a church that isn't in the way of the unstoppable gospel, but is constantly fueling it. Only then does God get the full glory, and only then do we or can we be the church he desires for us to be.